Mark Lila, politolog, historyk idei, dziennikarz i profesor nauk humanistycznych na Uniwersytecie Columbia w Nowym Jorku, autor między innymi książki Koniec liberalizmu, jaki znamy. Mark, are you there? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi there. Perfect. I can. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Um, so how important really is the crisis of liberalism and what we can do about it? Uh, well, the, the, there are many kinds of crises of liberalism right now. I mean, it's a strange time to be uh, acting, uh, to be asking the question, um, given the dramatic events of the past few months here in the United States and the dramatic events of uh, this past summer um, and the dramatic events of the past four years. This is all from an American perspective. Uh, but we're all um, struggling to understand, uh, in a sense, what remains of the old regime of liberal democracy uh, before this moment and uh, trying to determine uh, to what extent we can return to a kind of normality before all of this, or to what extent our politics uh, have been changed uh, fundamentally. So from point of view of liberals, how to build a message to the broadest possible group of citizens? Mark? Well, that's the, that's the challenge right now. Um, uh, one of the problems, uh, which is, uh, was the subject of my last book, The Once in Future Liberal, uh, was the rise of a kind of identity politics uh, that had made it difficult to reach in a more universal way out to citizens in, uh, again, the United States, but you can see this elsewhere. Now, uh, what I mean by identity politics is not um, the struggles for social justice of particular groups, uh, which people who don't belong to that group can join and support, um, given uh, their support for the principle of equality among, among citizens. What I'm talking about is another mentality, and that is the mentality that um, all politics begins somehow in an understanding of the self uh, and one's identity uh, in a narrow sense um, of one's sexual identity, say, or um, uh, one, one's racial identity. Uh, and the consequences of that are two. One is that um, it, uh, it gets people to focus their energies on achieving ends for their particular uh, identity group, which is fine, but makes it difficult for building coalitions or reaching out with a larger mes message that reaches all citizens as citizens. The other problem is that those who are involved in identity movements tend to devote all of their energy to that particular issue. But a successful politics uh, and a successful governing uh, uh, party requires a larger, more universal message that can play out elsewhere. Um, and so this has been one of the big challenges uh, for us uh, ever since the collapse of um, you know, the, the, the major ideological event in my lifetime, which, uh, and perhaps many polls, which is um, the rise of a kind of uh, social and economic libertarianism, uh, which began in the 1980s with Reagan and Thatcher, but then took off um, in the 1990s after the fall of the wall. So, uh, the question is whether uh, we can reimagine our national uh, futures and uh, what binds us together, having passed through this libertarian 
uh, experience, both on the left in terms of identity politics and on the right in terms of neoliberalism. So that fundamentally is the crisis that I see at the moment. Today, during the discussions um, um, in the European Forum for New Ideas, we spoke a lot about education. So what are your um, well, lessons learned? What can we do about education to educate um, new citizens, you know, young people? Yeah, in well, well, first we have to understand that um, we no longer educate our children. That is, our education, our basic education, does not take place at home, and it doesn't even take place in schools. It takes place in social media and through popular culture. This is where young people uh, uh, learn a lot of their values uh, and also some of their uh, political um, ideals. And so, uh, it would be nice to think that one could simply establish pro programs in civic education in schools and that that would be sufficient. But instead, the identity outlook, um, and I mean both personal identity on the left and national identity on the right, um, has, have become, the, these two forms of identity politics, have become the poles around which um, young people uh, are developing their political ideas and commitment. And so, for example, this past summer, we had this extraordinary event of a poor black man who, George Floyd, who was killed by the police in Minnesota. And uh, that event immediately galvanized young people, not only in the United States, as you might have expected, but also in other countries. There were massive demonstrations in Africa. There were massive demonstrations in countries like France and England that have a colonial past, but also in other countries that uh, have little or no black population. Uh, as you know, there were uh, demonstrations in Poland. There were demonstrations in Azerbaijan. There were demonstrations in Japan. So, uh, identity politics has actually uh, uh, become a kind of global phenomenon, both when it comes to sexual and racial identity, but also national identity. For example, I think it's safe to say uh, that um, a Polish nationalist today has more in common and feels more solidarity with a nationalist in Hungary then either of those people feel solidarity with gay activists in their own countries. So gay activists in Hungary and Poland kind of share a politics and an outlook and an identity focus, while nationalists in the two countries also sh share a more global ideology of national identity. So this is the new situation that we're coping with and uh, where that leaves civic education, I'm not sure, but the important thing is to begin by recognizing how rooted this outlook has become. So what, in your opinion, should be the response um, to the populist policy, more in general? Well, yeah, well, what's interesting about um, the kind of uh, ideology of national identity today is that uh, to begin with, it's become a global phenomenon. Uh, but the other thing is that it's not really about the nation uh, as such. Uh, it's about part of the nation, part of the nation that believes it's the true nation, as opposed to, let's say, globalized elites or immigrants. So uh, we're facing a situation where you have um, uh, populists who appeal to the nation, but they don't include everyone in the nation. And, uh, you know, my feeling has always been that in order to address people like that, that people uh, on the liberal center 
and liberal left have to learn again to speak about the nation and the need for not only solidarity within the nation, but also a sense of duty, not just a, a, a sense of rights. But so far, the language of the discourse of natural, national identity has been left to populists on the right. So the first thing to do for those who don't belong to uh, uh, that group is to uh, discover a way of talking about the nation as a whole. But if in certain countries, especially the United States, you're focused mainly on particular interest groups, gays, women, and so on, um, uh, you, you, you're not used to and you have some hostility towards speaking of the nation as a whole. That seems to me to be the fundamental roadblock right now. And how to prevent the escalation of the language, the populist language, which is present all over in the social media and in media, main media too? Well, if I knew the answer to that, I'd become a very famous and hopefully rich man. <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this has become our problem. Uh, we have yet to find a way to regulate the internet. And uh, there uh, is such a hostility. Uh, the, the ideology of the open internet and hostility to censorship uh, has given us essentially polluted waters that we all have to swim in. And unless there's concerted effort by national governments to control this, I have no idea, frankly, uh, what we can do about it. Uh, one can hope that passions eventually will diminish and that people will get tired of this. Uh, but uh, for the moment, it seems not. Um, it seems like a drug a lot of people are, are addicted to. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Thank you very much for your thoughts, but let me ask you one more question and ask you uh, to share your, your thoughts, your broader thoughts maybe, about the future of liberalism. Is there any future? Well, uh, as I wrote in my book, I thought the, the future depended on articulating a sense of social solidarity for the nation. But if this identity outlook has become our reality and that young people in particular uh, consider engagement with identity issues to be the foundation of their politics. It seems to me that we need to find a way to uh, incorporate concerns about identity into liberal discourse and not simply resist it, as I have been. I would like to think that it would be possible again to have a civic republicanism that appeals to citizenship. But if we cannot, if the identity outlook in terms of personal identity and national identity is simply too rooted for now, we need to find a way to appeal and attract uh, people who look at uh, the situation that way. You know, <coughs> excuse me, uh, recently I was teaching uh, Tocqueville's Democracy in America. And at a certain point, he talks about the difference between what he calls ancient and modern patriotism. He says that ancient patriotism is a kind of native love of one's own a love of one's family, a love of one's religion, a love of the landscape. And that uh, that comes naturally, or had come naturally to most nations and most peoples. But because of changes in modern consciousness, the hold of those symbols uh, simply was not as strong. And Tocqueville lectures the reader saying, once that happens, you cannot go back. Once one gives up baby food, one does not, as, as an adult, this is his example, go back to baby food. If we're in a new situation with a new political consciousness, 
then it's important to adapt our concepts and our rhetoric and our institutions uh, to that situation and to try to ennoble uh, uh, our politics as much as, uh, as possible. So right now, I have to say that I'm very much of a divided mind. On the one hand, I would like to hold on to the civic Republican ideal and hope that these identity passions pass. But if they don't, I think it means we're going to need really a fundamental rethinking of how to build social solidarity in a liberal democratic system. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And you know that the main topic of um, our discussions here during the uh, European Forum for New Ideas is what will happen tomorrow. So final question to you, what will happen tomorrow? Uh, yes, well, I can assure you that I haven't shaken hands with the president in a few weeks, so you're all perfectly safe. So nothing bad is going to happen tomorrow like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I wrote an article re re recently in the New York uh, Times about our, um, the human need for prediction and how in times of anxiety uh, we want someone to come along with a crystal ball and explain what's going to come, but that's not the way life works. Um, you know, uh, our march through history is like a blind person tapping on the ground and listening one step at a time. And if we make too many predictions, especially for example, here's an example about what's going to happen with COVID, and those predictions prove to be false, people develop a distrust of those who are responsible. So I think actually we should be making fewer predictions and simply paying attention to uh, you know, the, next, the next day and what we know uh, right now. The other reason is that this election that's coming up in the United States has obviously global significance. And I think it's important to think of it as a cancer biopsy. We know the patient is sick, but we have no idea how sick and where sick. And so what will be important is after the election, to try to interpret the results and to understand better what is going on not only in the United States, but what will happen globally because of it. And every nation has a stake. This is not simply American narcissism speaking, but every nation has a stake in what will happen here in a few weeks. So, um, you know, my advice is to take out your rosary between now and then and hope for the best, but then get to work intellectually trying to interpret the results. Mm. Thank you very much, Mark. I just learned that uh, you are coming to the um, European Forum for New Ideas in two years. So I will be. I yes, look forward perfect. to it. Yes, perfect. So 2022, we see you here in Poland, hopefully in Sopot. And no more coronavirus around us. Very good, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję. Thank you very much. Szanowni Państwo, Pan Mark Lila był gościem specjalnym Europejskiego Forum Nowych Idei. Edycja 9,5, czyli rok 2020, rok koronawirusa.